Um, well, I haven't come all the way from the United States to um, explain to people in Israel that they are or are not in the midst of a crisis of values. Um, so I'm going to talk in much more general terms. My we will be an in a very inclusive we. And I'm going to begin by objecting to the phrase, um, crisis of values is not the right description. Values don't have crises. People do, economies do, states do, political parties do. But values like life and liberty, justice and solidarity, love and compassion, these are, well, not eternal. I don't know much about eternity, but they are permanent. They endure in secular time, and we don't have to worry that they will lose their value. But men and women can devalue them in the sense that they don't act to make them effective, to recognize them, to enact and enforce them. The realization of values has its ups and downs, and we can say that a society where realization is down is a society in crisis. So is our society in crisis. The recognition of values seems at a high point these days. The right to life and liberty, the importance of equality, including gender equality, the necessity of welfare provision, the need to end global poverty, respect for our natural environment. We recognize all these values and many more, and I doubt that there's ever been a time in human history when this recognition was as nearly universal as it is today. But we obviously don't do so well in enacting and enforcing these values. Without the prior recognition, enacting and enforcing wouldn't be critical, and their absence wouldn't make for a crisis. We create the crisis by acknowledging what we need to do and then failing to do it. In this sense, it's better to be in a state of crisis since that state implies knowledge of the values to whose realization we are not yet committed. To my mind, the clearest sign of a global crisis of values is the failure to stop mass murder. Despite the commitment made at Nuremberg and in many UN documents that the Holocaust would be the last, the worst and the last of these crimes against humanity. We gave this name crimes against humanity to mass murder, which implies recognition, and we have enacted a ban. Genocide is now against international law, but we have not enforced the enactment. Despite the biblical injunction, we do stand by the blood of our neighbor. We watch the killing in places like Rwanda and Darfur and do nothing. That's a crisis, but it's not a crisis of values. We know the value of human life. We recognize, even the General Assembly of the United Nations recognizes the responsibility to protect. It's the failure to act that makes the crisis. In much the same way, no one defends the desperate poverty of hundreds of millions of people in the world today. The idea, another biblical idea, that the poor are always with us which has been the prevailing idea throughout human history, is today, for the first time, challenged and even rejected. We aim at the abolition of poverty, but we don't actually do the things that abolition would require. That's a crisis. Poverty and its attendant evils, widespread malnutrition, high rates of infant mortality, never before made for a crisis, but now they do. And that's a good thing. If but only if crisis is an incitement to action. If there were a crisis of values, we might look for philosophical or theological rescue. We would need a restatement of values, an analytical account of their meaning, a new or renewed description of their foundation in divine command or human nature or human reason. But I don't think that's what we need. No doubt philosophers and theologians should continue to do what they've always done, and the rest of us should listen to their arguments and hope for enlightenment. But our problems lie with action, not with thought. And that means that our problems lie with politics, because politics is about collective action. The state is our main agent when we act collectively. 
No international agency has yet superseded it. Though many professors and intellectuals who should know better talk about transcending the state, there isn't any transcendent authority that can take its place. If we mean to act against mass murder, we will have to do it through the state. The way the Vietnamese did when they shut down the killing fields, the Khmer Rouge killing fields in Cambodia, or the way the Indians did when they ended the terror in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, or we will have to do it through a coalition of states like NATO in Kosovo. All that the UN can do, though it didn't do it in any of those cases, is to authorize what states do. The failure of state action produces the crisis of mass murder. But you might say that the failure of state action is also the failure of citizens to press their states to act. So perhaps there is a crisis of citizenship. Another new crisis, that would be another new crisis since the idea that citizens should press their states to stop massacres in distant countries is a revolutionary idea. For most of human history, the response would have been, who ever heard of such a thing? Now that we have heard of it, we know, or many of us know, how we ought to act. We ought to form organizations and political movements and parties and we ought to try to influence the leaders of our states or to replace them if we can't influence them. When we engage in that sort of work, we are dealing with the crisis. And if enough of us engage, there is no crisis. 